You know, we live in a society where very few things are free. Although, I suppose an argument could be made that um, with the redistribution of wealth, uh, some people get away with getting some stuff for free, but generally and historically, we've lived in a society where nothing is free. There's no such thing as a free lunch. You've got to work for it. You've got to pay for it. If we work hard, we're rewarded in proportion to our hard work. If you work less, you get less. In our work, in our schools, in our lives here on earth, almost everything is based on a system of merit. You get what you earn, and you earn what you get, no more, and hopefully, no less. It has permeated our society, and it has permeated the church, because from the cradle on up, every one of us has had to live with a system of merit. And the result of that in the church is that it reflects the way we think God thinks about us. Oh, we understand. Salvation is free, but after you cross that line, after you've come into the family, you've got to earn it. It's all about merit. We've got the job, now we have to keep the job. We, we see he loves us, but now we have to make sure he still loves us. That carries over into our marriages also. We realize that our spouse was crazy enough to marry us, but now that we said I do, we think she might get smart and realize that we're not lovable. And so we have to earn that. The problem is that for God, it doesn't work that way. As a member of his family, you don't need to earn it. The grace of God isn't given on the basis of merit. We looked last week at, at Peter's question about forgiveness, and we looked at kingdom forgiveness. How much should we forgive? You remember Peter asked that question, is seven times enough to forgive a brother who sinned against him? Seven times! Twice as generous as most people in his time, and well, seven times as generous as people in our society. And remember, Jesus' answer is, seven times isn't nearly enough. Uh, the generosity of forgiveness ought to overflow. And, and today's story follows right on the heels of the question that Peter asked. Because Peter's going to ask another question in Matthew chapter 19. Uh, after Jesus has talked about forgiving generously... We're told that a, a rich person came to him and asked him, what does he have to do to enter the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus' answer was, well, go sell all you have, give to the poor, and come and follow me. The important part there being following Jesus, but Peter picks up on this. Peter, I think, thinks like me. Let's, let's have a formula. I want to be able to, to notch on my, on my iPad that I've forgiven you six times, and the next time that's it. I want to be able to, to recognize that, well, things should be fair and even. So Peter asks, after Jesus says, sell all you have, give to the poor and follow me, Peter says, hey, we've given up everything to follow you. What's in it for me? What's the reward system of heaven? So that I can set out and know that if I give up every Sunday morning, I'm going to get a, a preferred parking space in heaven. Maybe if I just go to church three Sundays out of the month, I'll, I'll still get a close parking space, but at least I won't be out in the boondocks. What's the reward system of heaven? What do we get? What's the formula of rewards? And in response to that question, 
Jesus tells this parable. It is found in Matthew chapter 20. For the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for denarius a day, he sent them into his vineyard. And going out about the third hour, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And to them, he said, go into the vineyard too, and whatever is right, I will give you. So they went. Going out again about the sixth hour and the ninth hour, he did the same. And about the eleventh hour, he went out and found others standing. And he said to them, why do you stand here idle all day? They said to him, because no one has hired us. He said to them, you go into the vineyard too. And when evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the laborers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last up to the first. And when those who hired about the eleventh hour came, each of them received a denarius. Now, when those hired first came, they thought they would receive more. But each of them also received a denarius. And on receiving it, they grumbled at the master of the house, saying, These last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But he replied to one of them, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Do you not, did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last worker as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or do you begrudge my generosity? So the last will be first and the first will be last. This is the word of God. What do we learn from this parable about godly, generous living? It's pretty obvious to any business person that Jesus is not laying out in this parable a kingdom-style business plan. He, if it's a business plan, it's a business plan of absurdity. Nobody would do that. Because on the second day, nobody would show up early. They would all wait around. Eventually, word would get out. Hey, that guy hires you at the 11th hour and pays you for a full day's work. It's not God's plan for business. It is God's plan for the generosity of grace. It is God's plan for the generosity of blessing. It is a kingdom model for being generous in the way we bless those around us. So what this teaches us is the mandate of giving blessings as God has given blessings to us. And so it shows us three standards of kingdom blessing, three observations. First is this, kingdom blessings provide help, not rewards. In the first century, they had a system which isn't all that dissimilar to what has been the uh, situation in the United States with union halls. You know, if you're, a, if you're a, a unionized worker and you go to the union hall and you wait there for work, and so they gather and then someone comes who needs work and they go to the union at the hall and they, and they pick people that work there. In the first century, it was the same thing, except there wasn't a union hall, there was a marketplace. And so people would arise, or arise early in the morning and they would go. These are people who didn't have the security of a 40-hour work week. These are people who only got a job by the day. They typically lived paycheck to paycheck. The only problem is that paychecks came at the end of every day. And so they would gather in the marketplace and wait for someone who had jobs to come and hope that they were hired. Well, this is what happens. It, it's kind of like what happened to me last Sunday night. Uh, Pastor Andrew was sick last Sunday, and so I had the opportunity to work with the youth group. And they're playing some games, and, and you know, um, it was really funny. I, was, I had some blood drawn this week, and someone said, oh, you've got a cat? And I said, no, I've got a youth group. Um, I, I, I hit the deck a couple of times, and, you know, and at the end, we're deciding they're going to play uh, Ultimate Frisbee. Now, I'm fairly athletic, and apparently I'm fairly old. 
they, the two high school boys are picking who's going to be on their team. First time in my life, first time in my life for an athletic event, I was picked dead last. I am relatively happy to say that my team won, um, but nevertheless, that's the way it was in the marketplace. If you're going to pick someone to come dig a ditch for you, you're going to pick the young guy instead of the old guy. The healthy guys. You want people that are, going to, that are full of energy and are capable of putting in a full 12 hours of work. You don't want a guy who's going to have to stop after three hours and catch his breath. Or take a nap. And who about the eighth hour is going, man, my back is so stinking sore. And so what would happen in the first century is there was a disincentive for the old guys, for the infirm, for the unhealthy, for, the, for those who were crippled. There was a disincentive for them to get to the marketplace early. Now, we look at this and go, man, look at those lazy people. They didn't get there. If they had just gotten there on time, they would have gotten the full day's work. Not on a typical day. On a typical day, people didn't come and say, I'm hiring the whole lot of you. What he did, he came and said, okay, you, and you, and you, okay, well, turn around once, I want to see how good, okay, we'll hire you. And they would leave with the choice crop of, of workers. We look at it and go, man, those crazy, lazy people didn't show up until the 11th hour. They probably were trained not to show up until the 11th hour. They weren't going to get the job anyway. The strong were hired first. And as a result of that, the strong were made stronger. They got their daily bread. And part of that issue of give us today our daily bread, they worked in a society where you got paid at the end of every day. And we think, well, the owner went there and he's getting his needs met. He's looking for workers, and there the workers are, and the, the workers are there. These are good people helping out the owner. But that is not the intent of the story. The intent of the story is that the owner or the master goes in order to meet the needs of the workers. Certainly at the 11th hour, he didn't need to hire whoever was still there. He could have just waited the next day, gotten more bang for the buck. The point of the parable is that the owner is not in desperate need of workers. The workers are in desperate need of work. The blessing is the master bestowing upon the workers life-giving opportunity. They needed him. They were the ones who were likely to go without food if they weren't hired. Kingdom blessings are like that. Kingdom blessings in provide help, not rewards. It isn't as though the, 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 the master divvied it up and say, okay, the people who started work first, they get the full day and the, the, the people hired last get one, one twelfth of the day's work, labors. He saw people in need and he addressed that need. He didn't reward the people for showing early. He blessed them and met their need. The, pa the, the master looked for people in need and he met that need without stripping the people of their dignity. It's interesting. He could have just gone and said, you know what, there's all these people in need. I am just going to provide you a good day off. He could have said that to the people who are in the 11th hour. He could have said, you know what, you haven't worked all day. I'll tell you what, I'm just going to give you a denarius because it's tough. We're living in a tough economic time. Here's a denarius. He said, no, come to work and I will do what is fair. We'll get back to what is fair later. But he just generously meets their need without stripping them of the dignity. He doesn't say, you're not capable of working. He says, come, work in my vineyard. I will give you what is fair. He treats them with generosity. He's not rewarding them for their work. He was filling their need. And kingdom blessings are like that. Kingdom blessings provide help, 
not rewards. The generosity in this parable is about giving people what they need. The second observation about kingdom blessings is that they promote grace, not justice. Now, it would seem that the owner, the landowner here, didn't really know much about business. I mean, honestly, do you think any business can survive with this type of a pay scale? It's kind of crazy. Jesus isn't teaching kingdom standards for business. What the landowner knew was grace. We want it to be about fairness. And actually, the term is used in here. The, the, the owner says, I will give you what is right, what is fair. We want Jesus to tell us a parable where everything works out, where the balance sheets make sense. We want to read this and say, let's make it fair. We want things to be fair, or so we think, but I wonder if we really want fairness. There's an old proverb that says, when we don't get what we deserve, or when we get what we deserve, that is justice. When we don't get what we deserve, that is mercy. And when we get what we don't deserve, that is grace. See, fairness, and our, our clinging to this concept of fairness, reveals how we misunderstand God's ways. God's kingdom is not based on what is fair, but upon what we need. We don't need justice. We need grace. Grace that overlooks all we are and all we have done and all we have said, which has fallen short, which is just about all that we have done and all we have said. Grace that allows us to stand in line knowing that God will smile upon us. Fairness is not what we want, because if fairness were the measure, then we would have to admit that we are a whole lot more like the 5 p.m. worker than the 6 a.m. worker. God's grace does not operate on the basis of what you do. It is not a blessing, it's not grace, if it is earned, if it is fair. If it is justice, it's not about what we deserve, but about what we need. When Jesus tells this parable, he's promoting grace, not justice. John MacArthur puts it this way. The charge of unfairness was not grounded in a love for justice, but in the selfish assumption that the extra pay they wanted was the pay they deserved. Grace is a free gift that we receive. It is not what is fair. Grace is inherently unfair. It is inherently about mercy, about blessing, not justice. God's grace is His grace. Whether you receive it early in life or late in life, it is still His grace, His blessing. Kingdom blessings, they provide help, not rewards. They promote just, a grace, not justice, and they produce winners, not losers. That's tough to figure out because we are still steeped in this tradition of merit where, where there are winners and losers. Winners work hard, losers are lazy. And then this parable comes along, and, and we have this mindset, don't we? It seems that both the workers and the hard workers, the ones who were there first, and lazy workers, that's what we call them, uh, we make an assumption based on them being hired last, that they were hired last because they were lazy. And we look at it, and, and it seems like there's something wrong with this. There's winners and losers. They shouldn't receive the same pay. Doesn't, doesn't seem right. And actually, if we, if we look at the story, they're both winners and losers. 
The, the people who got hired first, well, they were the daily winners. They won the daily game. They got there early. They got the job. They from the, from the beginning of the day, they knew they were going to make their day's wage. And those other people that didn't get hired, the, they were the losers. And then at the end of the story, the roles are reversed. At the end of the story, the losers that got hired last appear to be the winners because they get paid the same amount as the, as the winners who are now losers because they had to put in a full day of work. It's inconceivable. It just is wrong. Shouldn't there be winners and losers? That's what our society says. And... I'm kind, I'm kind of with Pete, Peter, Peter at times. Shouldn't there be some reward for having served all day? For having come to Christ at a young age? Some of you have been believers for decades and decades. And you could have been out having so much sinful fun. Deathbed confession should be outlawed. You, you shouldn't, shouldn't be able to get away with sin, sin your whole life and then, then slip in to the, the grace of God, God at the end. end. I, I want to ask you, Peter, I've, I've served you as a pastor for 30, 30 years. What's, what's my reward? What's, what's the, the celestial formula so that I'm a winner? Because I want to be a winner. I want, I want the special parking space in heaven. Surely the heavenly retirement system gives some credit for years of service, doesn't it? And Jesus says, no. God's blessing is grace. Receive it early, receive it late. The blessing is grace. Because what makes you a winner is being a recipient of God's grace. The tabulation of scores in heaven doesn't work like the tabulations of scores in an athletic event. There are only winners. God's blessings produce winners, no losers. You only lose if you begrudge the fact that there are no losers. Honestly, many of us identify with the employees who put in a full day's work rather than the add-ons at the end of the day. We like to think of ourselves as the responsible workers and the employer's strange behavior baffles us. But let's not miss the point of the story. God dispenses gifts, not wages. If it was about us getting our wages, we go to hell. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God, the grace of God, is eternal life. The gift is grace. Whether you receive it as a 10-year-old or a 90-year-old, it is grace. And grace makes us all winners. The parable ends with this question. Do you begrudge my generosity? What a question. I actually considered just talking about this question. At the end of the day, at the end of a long life of service of God, when you have faithfully served Him and, forgive, and, and given up the, the things which the world thinks are so appealing, the sins of this world, at the end of the day, and you look and you see some bozo who didn't come to Christ until his deathbed, and you think, wow, he got away with all that stuff. Are you kind of mad at God? Do you begrudge God's generosity? Understand this. Salvation early is better than salvation late. My guess is that when uh, someone who has given a deathbed confession, who comes to Christ at the last moment, when he gets to heaven, he beats himself and goes, I wish I had known Christ earlier. I wish I had 
known and lived my life different. And I don't think there's anybody in heaven who said, Man, I wish I had come to Christ on my deathbed. I wish I, I, wish I could have just rejected Christ my whole life. God's grace makes all of us winners. And we who have been blessed with so much should bestow generous blessings upon those around us. Not because they deserve it. Not about giving rewards. Not about seeking justice. Not about making winners and losers. Because if we, if we look at, at our blessing of people around us that way, we will never practice godly, generous living. But if we see our blessings as a reflection of God, we will provide help, promote grace, and produce winners who know Jesus. Our blessings ought to be generous because the blessings of God have been generous to us. Let's pray. Father, help us today to understand your incredible blessings. Help us to count our blessings. Help us to know that you have given us far more than we could ever give to those around us. Amen. Now, take it home. Be a blessing to someone. Not just today, but every day.